Test one two three. Test one two three. Hello, hello, hello. What the hell? How does this work? Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome to our new YouTube channel called Get That Bread. And my name is Stephen Lee. And I'm actually um, launching this in tandem with a podcast called Get That Bread. And I'll leave a, a link to it in the in the description below. So the way I'm kind of thinking about um, this YouTube channel and the podcast going forward is I, I want to be able to tell this conversation more towards um, investing in stocks and, gear, and, and kind of making it palatable to those folks who never... Um, who never, you know, pursued a college degree in uh, finance or accounting, who never took a corporate finance class, who never took an um, investment management course or, or pursued a, um, a career that was even remotely related to the financial industry. And yet we're still interested in kind of figuring out, okay, how do I get involved? How do I even approach the stock market overall? And I feel like I've met quite a few people who, who have reached – a certain life stage where they have a certain level of disposable income, some level of savings, and you know they have a 401k, but they just they don't exactly know some of the underlying mechanics of what drives asset prices higher or lower. Uh, one of my friends actually characterized it as like it's a black box. I just feed money into my brokerage account or my you know my 401k savings account, and at the end of the month, it just swings up and down and I don't understand exactly what's going on. So, you know, I kind of want to be able to um, address some of those factors. I don't think I can kind of go through the whole spectrum of all the nuances of the financial markets, but I, I want to be able to uh, tailor the conversation, like I said, to a specific niche part of investing. Uh, and that includes investing in the stock market. Probably later on, uh, it, you know, over the longer term, we can kind of discuss um, investing in different asset classes like, you know, preferred stock or, or bonds and, you know, some of the convertible securities that make things that are quite interesting to take a look at. But I think over the near to intermediate term, I think the conversation is going to focus strictly on stocks. So eventually, though, we want to be able to get you guys, especially the, the new folks who, who aren't all that interested or who aren't all that acquainted with the stock market. We want to get you kind of up to speed as far as some of the critical skill sets and some of the resources that you're going to tap, have to tap into in order to make better and more informed decisions going forward. Again, ultimately, we want to get to a place where we can do really deep dives and you know rigorously break down a specific company to be able to arrive at, okay, what is the intrinsic worth of this particular asset and is the price compelling enough for me to get involved? Okay, so before I dive into that, um, I, there's no way for me to kind of gauge where you are. So I'm just going to kind of, you know, start with the basics. And if you don't know what the stock market is or if you don't even know what a stock is at, at all, um, don't worry. I know it's going to feel like you're you're like drinking out of the end of a fire hose and it's like super overwhelming. But... Instead of feeling, instead of having the anxiety and the angst kind of set in, I, I hope you kind of be situate yourself in more of like um, a curious kind of mindset. Be willing enough to a ask questions and pull the strings. Keep on pulling at the strings. Keep on seeking out the answers. And so, uh, but with that, I think, um, and if you're very, very brand new and, and so you don't know anything about stocks, definitely supplement this resource, you know, this YouTube channel and the podcast, hopefully. Uh, with other resources um, like investopedia.com. I'll leave a link to that in the description as well. Great resource, great online tool. Uh, it'll get you up to speed with a lot of the kind of the industry lingo, the verbiage that, you know, um, you, you may not be all that familiar with. It'll even, it, it basically, it makes very complex ideas much more accessible. So circling back to that question, what is a stock? So a stock is essentially a, a fractional ownership interest in a larger publicly traded company. Publicly traded because the public, the wider public, can own interest, ownership interest in that business. And so that's all you I think at the root of what a stock is, that's what you got to understand. It's not some pieces of paper that randomly tick up and down in the stock market or on some screen. It's 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 actually representative of a small fraction um, 
of a business and the value of that business. And so um, over the short term, you could see fluctuations go up and down pretty dramatically. Like, you know, uh, I think Newell Rubbermaid the other day just dropped in value some 17 to 20 percent in a day. Boom, gone. That value, that value just like disappeared. But um, here's the interesting about stocks. The the current near term uh, price fluctuations Though they are some indication of the price, or, or, or rather, they are, though they are the indication of the pr- the value of the price, it may not be the true value of the underlying worth of the business. That's where we want to be able to dive in and see what what is that underlying worth and be able to capitalize off of the difference between the price being offered versus what the actual worth of the business is. Okay, so um, so yeah, so over the near term, you're going to have these disparities, but over the long term. Uh, you can be, you know, prices will mimic and move in tandem with the underlying worth of the business. Okay, so how do I actually even, um, how do I actually even start executing a trade? How do I even buy a stock? You can't do so through the bank account. What you have to do is um, set up what's so called a brokerage account. A brokerage account is similar to a bank account, but it's simply, you know, it's different in the sense that it's it's what's required for you to actually buy a financial security financial security aka financial asset and, and so what you need to do is and, there, and there's quite a few options out there um i personally use merrill edge which is kind of bank of america's brokerage retail platform uh, and i i think it's great because it's got a lot of uh useful instruments and tools on there like um, equity research reports that you can kind of tap into uh, and, and if you don't, if you're not familiar, equity research reports are simply um, analyst reports, Wall Street analyst reports that give you some context around uh, a specific industry or business. It's very informative to kind of color in between the lines as far as what's going on now. Um, it's something that I was actually involved with professionally after undergrad. So okay, so after Merrill Edge, you know, there's like TD Ameritrade. There's uh, Fidelity, Charles Schwab. There's, I think, Robinhood is a really popular one right now because you can execute trades um, without without incurring any transaction fees, which is, you know, that's pretty interesting. But I also noticed that I think you can't really buy or sell uh, pink sheets, uh, or at least some pink, she- pink sheets, pink sheet stocks. It's a different segment of the stock market. That stock doesn't really trade formally on any kind of major exchange or anything like that. Anyways, we'll, we'll get more into that later. So um, that's kind of how you start. So you open up a brokerage account. Let's say you go over to uh, Fidelity. You just go log in, go to Fidelity's website, open a new account. At the, op- at the uh, um, account opening process, it'll actually ask you to link your bank account with your brokerage account so you can transfer funds over or or after opening the brokerage account, you can move tra- funds right back into your bank account. It's quite easy. It'll take probably a few business days before your funds transfer over, and for you to be actually start, you know, actually executing buy buys on certain stocks that you're interested in, and then eventually for you to sell. So, um, quick thing that you need to know about um, how how you can find companies. Um, you can obviously find companies by just typing in their names. But usually in the stock market, there's ticker symbols associated with each of the public traded companies. So Apple, ticker symbols AAPL, Google, G-O-O-G, G-O-O-G-L. Google has two, t- two ticker symbols because they have dual class structure, three uh, class structure technically, I believe. But anyways, that's that's neither here nor there for now. Um, so that's kind of how you, you know, you go and you sign into your brokerage account. You want to buy Apple shares. You type in a, you take. You type in 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 some of the in one of the search fields AAPL. You buy. You put you put in your uh, the price that you want to you know execute the trade at, uh, whether it's a uh, a market order, a limit order, uh, and you can execute it that way. Some of these nuances like limit order, buy order, uh, or market order. Market order is just execute at, at whatever price that it's nearest at right now. Limit order is you actually set the price and that's where it executes the trade. All these kind of little nuances, definitely take advantage of investopedia.com. Probably somewhere down along the conversation, I'm not going to be able to define every single word uh, and kind of have a pause. But uh, if there's any kind of word that you're not, you're not you know, really understanding or I may mention that you're not very familiar with, give me a shout out, send, you know, give me a comment or send me an email. I'll be happy to try to a- answer some of your questions. Uh, but definitely uh, um, take advantage of investopedia.com. 
So, okay. So you kind of know uh, just the fundamentals of what the heck is a stock. Uh, you know how to start executing trades. The next thing that you want to be able to identify is uh, it's going to be uh, is a certain question. It's one question, and it's going to require some introspection. So what I mean by that is what kind of investor do you want to be? How to what extent do you want to be engaged in this particular activity? Uh, so. The question is, do I want to be a passive investor or do I want to be an active investor? So really quickly, a passive investor is someone who isn't active, who, who isn't um, who isn't necessarily picking the price, picking the time uh, to buy an underlying security. You're not really um, you're not really cherry picking specific stocks for your portfolio. And you know, more broad. I think a more broad definition or more popular definition of a, of a passive investor is simply someone who um, takes advantage of um, like you know other investment vehicles, like uh, a broader market ETF or a mutual fund that um, tracks the performance of say the S and P five hundred and isn't necessarily, uh, like I said, actively uh, or, or cherry picking the specific allocations or specific stocks to be um, allocated into the portfolio and, and at what price and at what price to exit. And so these kinds of variables and these kinds of factors are not a part of the capital allocation process for the passive investor. And that's completely fine. You know, if you if you go ahead and look at a decade's worth of data uh, in terms of how the stock markets have performed, it's um, it's it's done quite well. You know, uh, I, I think it's done anywhere between seven to ten percent in annualized returns over um, decades, and so if you compound that over you know your lifetime, uh, you're gonna you're gonna do fine. Uh, you're basically betting on the strength and the overall um, future prosperity of the United States economy if you buy a basket of stocks say like the S&P 500, which mimics the returns of uh, that particular uh, indice and so, um, or index. And so, you know, you're, you're, you'll, you'll do fine and there's nothing wrong with you, you pursuing that route. And so, but on the flip side, if you, if you wanted to pursue active investing, active investing is a totally different animal. Active investing, you, the only reason why you'd want to pursue active investing is because you think that you can gain an edge or generate a rate of return ultimately that's going to be better than what the overall markets can offer you. And now it's it is a challenging undertaking, but there is quite a bit of academic data and uh, also just real life professional practitioners today who seem to demonstrate that that's not impossible. It's it's actually quite it's actually it's been done it is being done today and it will continue to be done in the future and uh, if you look at some of the common um, common denominators between what are the characteristics for these people who have been able to uh, generate these outsized returns and what were the academic um, conclusions around you know some of the some of the strategies that generate the outsized returns it's it all comes back to this underlying idea of value investing okay so what is value investing it's basically um, buying an asset at a price that's far less than what it's actually worth what a, okay another analogy I'm buying a dollar for 50 cents so another example could be um, it's more a little bit more grounded in I think real life examples. Um, it could be like as if you're shopping for a home. Let's say you kind of narrow down a particular town or a particular neighborhood that you're really interested in, and, and you know you you hone in on, on a particular block, and you notice that all the houses on this block right are, um, you know they have the same acreage, the same bedrooms, same number of baths. Um, the square, you know, the square footage is within one to two percent difference. It's the relatively the same. They're all the buildings were all built around the same period of time, generally the same. You get my point. So, and then you kind of notice that at, at the end of the street, two homes sold for two hundred thousand dollars each. And now on this particular street, in, in the particular home that you're interested in, you notice that the offer price for you is a hundred thousand dollars. And you start scratching your head and you start to kind of. Um, asking a few questions and, and kind of trying to find the answer. 
right? So you find out, okay, there's no like radioactive material on the ground. There's no dead bodies in the closet. There's no ghosts in the attic. It's, it seems to be, um, it seems to be a fine home. And you kind of, you know, you ask your real estate agent a few more questions. Okay. What's the situation here? What's going on? And you find out that, oh, okay. The previous, the previous, the previous owner, um, is in a distress situation. Let's say for some unfortunate event occurred and he or she needs to be able to, uh, he or she's actually in a situation where they, they're forced to sell that asset uh, almost immediately. And uh, so you're in a fire sale situation almost. And so boom, right there, you're, you're, you've, you've got, you're being offered an asset that's far, that's priced at far wor- far lower than what it's actually worth. You're buying an asset for 50 cents on the dollar. $100,000 is 50% of $200,000. So that's kind of, you know, that's kind of the scenario that you want to be able to look for. And they actually do, in fact, arise. And in later episodes, I actually want to show you those real life examples and kind of walk through with you in terms of critiquing Okay, so what is the perspective of return potential? What are the risks of getting involved in these kinds of situations? But just broadly speaking, that's kind of how you want, I want you to kind of, that's the framework that I hope that you step into. And it makes quite a bit of sense, right? Um, I think a very famous investor said it like this one time, and his name is Benjamin Graham. And he said that, uh, I like buying my stocks like the way I buy my groceries, I like buying them at a discount. And so it's kind of the same. You see the framework? You're trying to buy something at a price that's far lower than what it's worth. And that differential between the value, the intrinsic value, and the price you're getting is your return potential. And and it's in in the value investing community, that differential is, is quote unquote, you know, considered your margin of safety. Okay, so moving on from the theoretical definition of what value investing is all about, I do want to lay down, lay down um, the emotional and psychological temperament that I think is going to be absolutely critical for you to be able to invest prudently and success, successfully over the long term. And, and you know, in order to do that, I want to reference two quotes. But in order to invest successfully, I think you need to be able to manage uh, two things very, very well, and that's fear and greed. So let me read the first quote to you right now. And this quote comes from uh, arguably the most successful investor in the world, uh, and that's Warren Buffett. And he says, to invest successfully over a lifetime does not require a stratospheric IQ, unusual business insights, or inside information. What's needed is a sound intellectual framework for making decisions and the ability to keep emotions from corroding that framework. So the framework that he's talking about and he's referencing um, is value investing. Uh, If you go on and and kind of continue on what he says, he says, this book, The Intelligent Investor, who his his kind of mentor and a one-time boss authored, Benjamin Grimm, he says, this book precisely and clearly prescribes the proper framework. You must apply the emotional discipline. So key. And now that's fear. You know, there's in, in any person's um, experience investing in the stock market, there's going to be a period of time where all you see is red. The whole markets are bleeding. And, you know, fear is uh, is a very contagious thing. And it, you know, it'll it'll start seeping into the most even the most seasoned investors. And so being able to maintain your presence of mind and not not selling the underlying securities that you're holding on to assuming that you've done the homework and assuming that your t- interpretation of the the facts and the evidence is sound um, you can't you can't allow other people's emotions and other people's interpretations to affect uh, your investment um, decisions especially in a time of market volatility now, on the flip side, in the same way regarding fear, you know, I think uh, hubris and I think greed can kind of cause you to shoot yourself in the foot as well. So Charlie Munger, who is actually happens to be a Warren Buffett's uh, partner and he, he's co-chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, uh, which is, you know, Warren Buffett's larger company. Uh, he says this, someone will always be getting richer faster than you. 
this is not a tragedy. And the reason why I think that's so key, and it's applicable to so many different facets of your life, but especially in the context of investing, the reason why I think that's so key is because whenever you see your peers, whenever you see your friend, or when you ever see the broader markets just outperforming your overall portfolio, even though you're sticking to uh, this framework, there's going to be such an enormous internal uh, pressure to compromise what it is that you know to go after the quick gain um, without, you know, and, and so that could that could lead you down a path where you can make a series of decisions where, where you're getting involved in certain investment activities that while you're not really familiar with what's going on, simply because your peers or some segment of the market has seen outsized returns, you'll want to get involved, which is highly speculative. You know, there's a there's a big difference between speculation and investing. And so, you know, greed can make you go down that route. And I think it's a very slippery slope. So just because you hear these big fish stories or just because you hear your friend uh, making outsized returns by playing the volatility index like the VIX or something like that or some other um, financially engineered investment vehicle and you don't understand all the risks that are entailed and involved with those kinds of instruments you know you could you could really hurt yourself uh, financially speaking and, and that's kind of what we what we want to stay away from and that kind of segues perfectly into the next last point which I think is and I'll say it, and I'll continue to say it at, my, at the expense of my own credibility. You need to think independently for yourself. Um, I think I remember hearing Manish Pabrai, who is a very famous investor in Southern California, uh, who employs value investing strategies. He was actually referencing, I think, Warren Buffett. And he was saying that you can't outsource the investment research process to someone else. So you can't you can't trust the podcaster, you can't trust the YouTuber, you can't trust a talking head on CNBC or CNN about the investment decisions you that you're going to make, especially if you want to be an active investor. You 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 want to think for yourself. You want to access the facts and the evidence and interpret it for yourself, and then make the decision on your own. Um, I hope that through this channel. I can teach you how to access that, that information. I can teach you how to interpret that information. But um, ultimately, also in addition to that, I hope I can show you and, and allow you to be informed enough to cherry pick those things that you think will be advantageous to you. And I hope that you're not in this situation where you're just banking all your investment decisions on someone um, in the online world. Okay, so with that, as we conclude this episode, I just want to give you a quick heads up around what we're going to be discussing in the later episodes. So we're going to dive into uh, discussing financial metrics, and I think it's going to be a good stepping stone for us to dive much more deeply later on into uh, a much more rigorous and deeper level of valuation work. And, and again, all of this is going to be cumulative for us to be able to unpack stocks ultimately. And so, especially for the newcomers, I hope that you don't feel... Um, intimidated or daunted by the subject matter, but rather, I hope it ignites within you a certain level of curiosity to ask questions, to not only just stop at the questions, but to, to seek out the answers. And hopefully I can um, g help guide you along in this journey and, and help you make more informed decisions about your investment portfolio. So if this episode is something that you're interested in and, and you enjoyed it, I, I ask and I'd really appreciate it if you, give us a, if you hit the subscribe button give us a like and um, let your friends know that this resource is there. So without further ado, let's just dive right in. Let's get the ball rolling and let's just start talking about stocks.